Hi there, welcome to Behind the Charts. We're sitting down today with Tony Dwyer. Tony is the Chief Strategist at Canaccord Genuity, also at DwyerStrategy.com. I've known Tony for a number of years, used to read his research was when I was on the uh, buy side. Uh, he does a, such a great job of connecting the charts to everything else. He's not a technical analyst, he's a strategist. And I love hearing strategists or talking to strategists that think about the visualizations, think about the charts in relation to all the other things. If there's anyone I've ever met who helps understand why the charts are evolving a certain way, it's Tony. I especially like how he thinks about uh, some technical indicators, how he thinks about the relationship of different assets and also to the macroeconomic and geopolitical data. Tony is also an accomplished private pilot. We actually started our uh, pilot training together. He finished it and went on to very good things in the air while I struggled to get through it. So Tony is an accomplished uh, pilot as well as strategist. So ladies and gentlemen, here's Tony Dwyer from Dwyer Strategy. Hey there, we're sitting down with Tony Dwyer. He's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity. You can find him at DwyerStrategy.com. Tony, thanks so much for joining Dave, me. Dave, what a pleasure. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, buddy. I, I'm so excited for this conversation because there's a lot of things we can dig into. Um, you know, uh, first off, just for those that are not familiar with you, your process, can you just talk about how you got to this point um, and just how you think about the markets, how that experience has shaped how you approach market analysis? So when I got to Wall Street, Dave, I was a, a political science major from a upstate New York um, Jesuit school with like 2,500 people. Right. So when people think of what I do now, they can't imagine it. <laughs> right? So I came down to New York City to interview um, actually for a fine jewelry company that I was a, a part-time salesman at. I didn't know that. Right? Okay. So yeah. I got to New York and my mom said, you have to meet this guy named Bob Erico, who was the head of national sales and marketing at Prudential Based Securities. Okay. And I ended up getting a job there. As soon as I walked into his office and saw the flickering lights on what the Quotron back before there were actually colors, right? Um, I said, I got to do that. And I heard him talking to the uh, wealth managers. And I, I got to do that. So I got a job in equity research. Okay. And my initial job as liaison in equity research was to um, reprint, in other words, summarize what Greg Smith, Ed Yardeni, and Joe Feshback. Uh -huh. And then it soon became Ralph Akinpora. Right. What those guys were saying each day. So my process, Dave, is not wrapped up in some academic study that I think should work. It's based on combining all the disciplines to come up with the best strategy for both our institutional wealth management clients. Interesting. So you mentioned a couple names that I'm sure a lot of the viewers are familiar with. Edgar Denny, who's a you know, prominent strategist. Yep, he was well. the economist at the yeah, time. Absolutely. And Ralph Eccomporo is a well-known technical analyst, mentored many of us. Would you say that learning from them was, was a, shaped how you think about things? Or how did you, what, any examples of oh, things yeah. you learned from them and that, it, that it's applying to what you do now? I, Greg Smith, and, and we can't forget Greg, Greg was a yep. master yep. as a strategist. He was the okay. institutional all-star strategist for years and years and years. Right. And the reason was because he can put together all the disciplines. And that's, that's really where I learned how to do it. Yep. He didn't have an ego that said, I'm right, and you guys, your technicians are wrong, or you economists are wrong. He right. took what, what historically works from them. Um, but I'll never forget Ralph Eckenpore one time telling me, you know, he's like, two things. First, I went on TV, and it was my first time on TV. I work with Larry Wachtel, if some people mm -hmm. remember sure. Larry Wachtel. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he hurt his knee, and he'd let me go on FNN. Okay. Right? And I went on FNN, and Neil Cavuto was interviewing me and it was kind of bonkers because I had never done it before. I think I was like maybe 22 or 23 years old, clearly with enough knowledge base to do it. Right. So, he, right. so I go up and I'm looking at the camera and the earpiece falls out. And it is Neil Cavuto is asking me about the difference between T-bills and the Deutschmark, which, which you might have as well have spoken a different language to me. Right. But eventually I just gave up. I knew I was going to, I thought I might go to grad school. So I just <laughs> started talking, right? And, it, and that was enough. But yeah. Ralph Eckenpoor grabbed me afterwards and he grabbed me by the tie and he pulled me close like this and he goes, kid, if you ever don't look at the camera again, I will rip <laughs> your throat out, right? So I've never not looked at the camera, right? That's the number one thing. And he also said something to me that was very important. They'll never remember your call. 
they'll remember how you and who you are, how you are and who you are. And I've, I've thought of that frequently in, in a world of social media and financial media. You, so that's such a fascinating quote. And we were talking earlier just about, you know, you're on in financial media regularly. And it, it strikes me that you always come across as super thoughtful, super contained and relaxed. How do you stay centered and stay focused on what you're doing in, a, in an industry that's built on sensational, you know, building up of things and all of that. How do you, how do you balance that? I think, Dave, one of the reasons we're friends yeah. is it's, it's, it's the idea that my job isn't there to look right. My mm-hmm. job is there to help people. Mm-hmm. Like, and I, I think like it's it. been lost on, on Wall Street that, yeah. you know, because TV and, you know, you go out there as the biggest bull or the most accurate target, that was great for last year, but who cares? Honestly, who cares? It's all about the process of how to help somebody make a a better investment decision for them. And when I focus on that, I'm not worried about me. Yeah. I'm just worried about conveying the day. Listen, I've been doing this since 1990 or 1991, FNN days. If I'm doing this for my ego at this point, I really should hang up the cleats. All right? I mean, seriously, I've, done, I've been on enough TV. I, I'm good. Yeah. I, do it, I do it in a lot of ways because I truly, I think, um, it's dangerous some of the information that's out there. Mm-hmm. And, and I think Cram, Jim, my friend Jim Kramer kind of addresses this too. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, you know, he's the mad money guy, so he's a little more volatile than me, but, but the guy really is built about education. Yeah. And I think that's when I go on TV, I try to remember, I'm not there to tell people what to do. Mm-hmm. How am I supposed to know? And I say it very publicly, how, how are we supposed to know how to advise the Dave Keller family? I have no idea how much money you have, where it's allocated. It's yeah. none of my business. Yep. Yep. My, my call is, what's the economic backdrop? What's the geopolitical backdrop? What's the history of the markets when it's that backdrop, and how do I present that to you the most efficient way? Right. You strike me, I mean, I followed your work for years back in my Fidelity days, used to love sitting down with you anytime I could. You always have struck me as someone who has a a great read on market history, as you mentioned, just the historical ramifications. When you're looking at the markets now, sort of late 2019, you know, market at all time highs, is there a historical period or a... Uh, another time that this feels like or looks like and why or why not? Buddy, this is, this is so exciting because yeah. so many people weren't in the, they remember the 1990s totally different than they, than they actually happened. Right. It wasn't a straight up line. I mean, I, I remember almost losing my job in 1993 or four yeah. because Wall Street was so bad because of the pressure on commissions. Sound familiar? Right. So um, what had happened is the Fed went into 1994 yeah. and doubled interest rates. Their last rate hike was early 1995, February 1st of 1995. The yield curve got down to seven basis points. So you really came close to an inversion of the yield yep. curve, yep. 210 yield curve. And then Greenspan um, realized that he was so fearful of inflation, but there was no pickup in inflation. Right. And, he, and he knew that he had over-tightened. So by the time the economic data started slowing in mid-'95, they actually cut rates. When the S&P was up, 1994 was a down year. 1995 was up 34%, and they cut rates twice. What was interesting during that time, though, is Bill Clinton was being investigated for Whitewater. Paula Jones was suing him. There was a special prosecutor named. And to get out of the headlines, they started a trade war with Japan. Mm. So they threatened 100% tariffs on the top 13 Japanese cars. Yeah. Right? So that, it's not so different than, than today. Eventually he got impeached, you know, which looks like a, an issue today as well. So there's a lot of similarities there. But that's when the Greenspan put was developed. Right. Greenspan right. said that he was going to protect from having too much downside without a lack of inflation. God, the mother of all Fed puts just got engaged. You know, Powell just literally said, when somebody asked him at the press conference after the last FOMC meeting, what would make you raise rates? And he said, he said, you would have to have inflation go meaningfully above our target rate, which is 2%. Right. It's at 1.6% on the core PCE. Their own five-year forward break-even is 1.6%. Dude, uh, you know, if you want an average of 2% and you got to get meaningfully above that, yeah. They may not be raising rates for the rest of my career, which most people say, okay, what are you retiring next year? Right. No, <laughs> right? <laughs> my lifestyle won't afford that. Right. Right? But, at the, but at the end of the day, that is like the mother of all Fed puts. That's right. They just yeah, yeah, yeah. told you yeah. 
they're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future. What do you think drove the valuation of the market to 30 times earnings by 1999 and 2000? Mm -hmm. You knew the Fed wasn't going to get in your face. That's right. the, the driver of the main declines of this cycle, whether it be the 2011 decline, the 2016 decline, or the 2018 decline, mm -hmm. was all fear of tighter monetary conditions coming from the Fed. Right. You know, we talked about the, you know, uh, the situation now with the Fed, the Fed put, um, and comparing now to sort of that mid-90s period. But one very big difference, obviously, is social media. So just in the last week, you know, a single tweet or a rumor, you know, moving the markets up and down based on that. During your career, you've seen this influx of the, of the impact of things like social media on market movements. How has that changed your project process, or how have you adapted to... What's happening, or have you just kind of gone straight through it? No. It really doesn't do anything to it, Dave. Yeah. I, if you think about all the craziness of the last two years, yeah. you had a down 20% move one year, and now you're up 25% this year. Yeah. A lot of tweets back and forth. What is the only thing that has ultimately mattered? The perception of, and direction of monetary policy. Right. 2018 right. was a result of a Fed that over-tightened. 2019 is a, is a result of a Fed that has eased. So let's talk about the trade war for a little bit because sure. people, so let's say um, a pair of jeans, what I, I have no idea what it's, what it's on, I don't really care. Yeah. Let's say a pair of jeans or the pink sweater costs an extra five bucks, okay. right? Or a Big Mac because of soybeans or whatever costs an extra 30 cents. Let's say it goes up five to 10%. Yeah. Are you not gonna spend money because of that? Okay, so then the next question becomes, if you just refinanced your mortgage and saved anywhere between $500 and $2,000 a month, that is real, mm. right? The pair of jeans, the pink sweater, the Big Mac doesn't cost that much more, and so many people just refinance their mortgage. Yeah. My, my um, uh, executive assistant, Kelly, who you, you guys talk to, yeah. she's actually my business manager, not my executive assistant. Mm -hmm. She just refinanced and she saved hundreds of dollars a month. We were at Fast Money one day, there was a technical guy there who heard us talking about it. He told us he saved $1,200 a month. <laughs> Anywhere between a few hundred and 1,200 yeah. is a lot of money. It's, a number. it's yeah. not caught forever. Yeah. So the drop in interest rates that came with a weaker economy because of the trade war, people should be thanking the trade war right, because right, it gave right. them cheaper debt, companies as well. So yeah. you go into a recession, people, I think, totally screw this up. You go into a recession when companies need money and don't have access to it because mm -hmm. then they have to cut production, which hurts their suppliers. Yeah. They have to lay people off, which hurts households. That's how you end up in a recession. Companies have total access to money right now yeah. And the only time that it stalled is because they didn't want to take the money, not because they couldn't get the money. Right. That's what investors should look for when they're looking for a recession. Interesting. Now, I love to ask people about what they do outside of finance and how that informs or, or shapes how they approach investing. You and I have a common interest in aviation. You are way more accomplished than I think I'll probably ever be. You've outpaced me, you know, private pilot and have, and have owned planes and, and everything. What has that experience of learning to fly an airplane, how is that related to investing or any lessons you've learned from flying that yeah. has made you a better or more thoughtful investor, do you think? So we were talking ahead of time. I was on Fast Money last night at CNBC, yeah. and you know, I was on there, and the biggest bull gets more bullish. And I, and I said, you know, how about instead of the biggest bull, how, how about the best process? Let's, <laughs> let's go with, I literally said that on there. Let's go with the best process, because that's really what drives my opinion. I, I don't really care if I'm the highest or lowest. I think the whole thing's kind of silly. Yeah. The whole um, way that I address um, the markets, both on a macro and and stock market standpoint, yeah. is by following a pretty good process. And as you know, as a student of aviation, that's all about process. The, be Absolutely. the most interesting thing I hear when, I, when people find out I'm a pilot is, oh, that's so scary, like it's this adrenaline rush nutty thing. Yeah. As you know, there's a checklist. Right. You have to go through the checklist. If you want to live and fly safely, you have to go through the checklist every time, no matter how long you're a pilot. That's right. the, the folks flying the 777s and the Airbus A3, whatever they are, yeah. they Just have a very through. clear checklist. Yep. You see the pilot outside, and he can barely, you need a, a, a telescope to see, <laughs> to see up that yeah. high now, yeah, yeah. but they're checking they the plane. It. There's a very clear process before you take off. Yeah. And I think that's, that's exactly how. It's the same thing as with scuba diving. I love to go scuba diving. Right, right. Right, it's the same thing. You have a process that you follow before you get in the water. Hmm. 
doesn't yeah. start when you're in the water. Right. It's if, if you're already, if you're making a decision based on being in the water and you don't know what you're doing, right. that's how mistakes can happen. Right, right. So I've learned through those mistakes. You and I have made a lot of mistakes. We're, Absolutely. we're really good at it. <laughs> I'm really good. I'll keep it to myself. How do you avoid those mistakes? You learn from them and put yeah. them in your process. Why were they wrong? One thing I love to do, and I, I like to joke that, you know, um, when I tell people that I microfiche the 1995 Barons and Business Weeks to kind of review that period, yeah, yeah. when I ask when I ask younger people what's microfiche, they think it's a, a biotech company, or something, <laughs> right? But what it really, but I actually I go it. to the library and do the research so that I yeah. make sure the process that that I'm using today is something that I used back then and was used back then, and how would it have worked? I think it's really doing the research and putting in the time. Yeah is the key to this whole game. So you talk about process a couple of times, which, which is great. Can you give us a little bit of window into what your process is? Do you have a daily, a daily routine or a weekly routine to try and consume information, consume charts, what other data you would look at, or how do you sort of go about absorbing that stuff? At this point in my career, there's enough of a feedback loop from the client base mm. that most of my research process is listening to questions or comments from the client base, looking back and seeing if it makes sense or not. Right. But ultimately, we've come down to a process of five core facts, okay. market facts. These are not Tony Dwyer opinions because they'd be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're market facts. The yeah. market is driven by the direction of earnings. Okay. Right. The direction of earnings is driven by economic activity. Economic activity is driven by availability of money. That's driven by Fed policy, and that's driven by core inflation. The Fed told us what they look at. Yeah. I like to research what they tell us what they look at. Right. So right. for example, the Fed is doing X, Y, Z. People keep wrap, get wrapped up in if that's right or wrong, good or bad. Who cares? Yeah. They told you what they're doing. Right, right. Well, like you, you should bemoan that the market's up 25% because it's, it's Fed driven. Yeah. They told you what they were doing. <laughs> That's the thing that blows me away. It's like, oh, those, that Fed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's really, it's really driven by inflation and then going yeah. through those things. And then that's from the fundamental side. To bring in the technical side, which we're so familiar with, yeah. um, I have four key tactical indicators I use. Okay. Percentage of stocks above the 10 and 50 day, Got it. level of the VIX, mm -hmm. the investor's intelligence bulls, and the, my favorite intermediate term indicator, the weekly stochastic, the 14 week stochastic. Got it, on the S&P. On the S&P 500. Okay. Right. When it gets to <laughs> December 24th, I'm sitting, too much information, I'm sitting in my hot tub. I got my head in my hands and I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do for a living. You know, here comes Mr. Bull telling them to buy 10% ago. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. not such, now it was a good call back then. Yeah. It didn't feel like such a good call. I'm trying to feel like how I'm gonna not go to zero, yeah. right? Um, and that weekly stochastic, in its mm. history, has never closed a week below five. In its history, wow. it was resting at one on Christmas Eve. Wow, right. In history, yeah. it didn't get yeah, the yeah, crash yeah. of 87 or any other time. It's not gonna close at one. Yeah. Right, so that, that you knew that it was an extreme. When the VIX jumps above 20 after a period of low volatility, pay attention. If that's coupled with a percentage of stocks above the 10 day, dropping below 10%, which is a Lowry's kind of indicator, uh, yeah. which is another technical service. You know, if you put this mosaic of technical factors together, like for example, right now, I just upped my target and everybody's so excited about that as I am. It's, I think I'm too low, honestly. Right. Um, and you're, it's like 34, 40, 34, 40 I'm yep, right, right, right. Um, I think I'm too low, but as, I, yeah. as I've been saying, that there's a big difference between not chasing the market and being negative. Our four tactical mm, indicators yep. are still overbought. Right. Like, so I, and they're, they're working off that overbought. That can happen from sideways action. That can happen from a little bit of downside. Yeah. So I typically would rather add exposure. I, I'm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't cut back. I mean, that doesn't make any sense right, given right. the fundamental view. But you don't need to chase new money in. You don't need to say, oh, I got, that fear of missing out, I think, is a really dangerous 
acronym. Huge problem. Right. One more question just on the markets, right? So you have the market at new highs, you, you know, you're pretty constructive for going into new year, but you've had the situation where I think a lot of individuals have been caught off guard by the leadership picture with, you know, utilities and real estate leading at a time where you'd feel that would be, you know, something that would maybe underperform in a risk on environment, uh, small caps underperforming when people might expect them to be outperforming. How do you reconcile the broad market, the impact of the Fed, the monetary policy with leadership that doesn't seem to agree at times. How do you reconcile those? In your it, it's interest rate driven. It's a great okay. point. So, so for example, I get a lot of questions about small caps and international versus U.S. when it's a risk on game. Yeah. And if you look at the last couple of, we're, we're emerging from the third mini recession of this cycle. Yep. In 2011, the market went down 19.6%. I think one of the biggest things that it's, I think, lazy analysis when people say we're, we're in an 11-year bull market. Right. Without any bear markets, nineteen point six percent is twenty percent. That's pretty, that's pretty right? close. Yeah. So that's two thousand eleven. Yeah. The bot, the market went bounced twenty two percent by the time that the ten year note yield bottomed. Mm. So it was very consistent with in, in two thousand twelve. So that it was very consistent with what's happening today. Recently, right. the same thing happened in two thousand and sixteen, where you were down on roughly fifteen percent. Right. The ten year uh, in February eleventh of two thousand sixteen. The, mar the bond market went down to 1.34% by July. Again, S&P up 18% from the low as the 10-year note yield dropped. Defensives were outperforming. Right. That same thing happened going into the low in the bond yield by September 3rd of this year. Right. So what happens when rates bottom, which we believe they did in September 3rd? Offense is the game. Got when it. rates are going up, you want to play offense. And by offense, again, not my opinion, what, is, what led in those prior two mini, post mini recession areas, it was financials, information technologies, and industrials. Most people, Dave, wouldn't believe that industrials are the second best performing sector this year. No. Last I looked. Right. Wow. That's a great take. I appreciate it, Tony. This has been really Dave, good to sit so down with fun. you. Yeah, You're good the to best. see you. You're the best. I appreciate it. And listen, thanks Thank for all you. you've done to educate, I think, individuals really well on how to think of the markets. Well, thanks, Dave. Appreciate it.